Well, good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Chris Wesson. I'm head of research here at Pepperstone, where it's been an emotional, challenging week for traders. It's been exhausting. Um, and, you know, there's really no end in sight to actually how this is all going to go. Trying to make a playbook in this is what I do every Friday is, is looking at the event risks in markets, the catalysts that are coming through the landmines that we need to navigate our portfolio through. But in an environment where absolutely nothing makes sense, there's dislocations coming across all parts of financial markets, trying to make a playbook around that is impossible to do. I think we need to take a step back and understand at the heart of this issue, at the very heart of this issue, is an unwind of a Fed-inspired trade. They engineered, financially engineered markets, they incentivized risk parity funds or multi-asset managers, pension funds, real money accounts to sell volatility, to be in these markets, to enhance, enhance their yield by selling volatility. That has unwound in a, in a heart rate. Volatility has beget more volatility and until the VIX can trade back down to 25% or somewhere more, more normal levels, uh, you know, it's very, very difficult to suggest that we're out of this woods at the moment. The fact that the VIX has traded up to all-time highs or near all-time highs and, and well above its long-term moving averages for so long uh, is, is shows us that we are in a new paradigm for these markets. And until the VIX can settle down, you know, I think we are going to be in for further fund flows. And that's really been at the heart of this matter. It's been this massive liquidation of positions. It's been this move into money market funds. If you have a look at the recent Lipper data, we've just seen $249 billion going into money market mutual funds. This is the safest of safe. People want cash. People want out of markets. They want to be in cash and they want to be in the US dollar. They're the two thematics. They are the safe havens at the moment, the dollar and money market funds. If you have a look at what we've been seeing in treasuries, well, that's been confusing for a lot of people. People have been running the 60, 40, 70, 30 portfolio, and they've suddenly seen this massive move at the back end of the curve, specifically this really violent steepening that we've been seeing um, of twos, tens, or three month, 10 year, or whatever the country is, whether it's Germany, you've been seeing this massive steepening of the curve. Well, is that because we're gonna see higher issuance coming from, these, from the governments as they pay for a lot of these fiscal packages? Perhaps. Is it the idea that generally when you see quantitative easing, you do see a steepening of the curve? I think that's probably right. There's an anomaly that you believe that when you actually start seeing quantitative easing from central banks, that you should see long end yields moving lower. Actually, over QE1, QE2 and QE3 from the Federal Reserve, actually, we saw a rapid steepening. Most of the flattening co took place uh, as we saw um, uh, quantitative easing being speculated on. But we are in a position now where volatility remains high. We've talked about credit spreads blowing out and that remains a concern. Have a look at what we've been seeing in this chart here now. We can see blue line being the high yield credit spreads or the high yield index relative to that of the US Treasury market. That's blown out to the highest levels really since 2009, 2010. Investment grade credit spreads. I've looked at the lowest form there, the triple B. You know, they've started moving up quite aggressively as well. If you have a look at what's happening in high yield energy, well, that's just been absolutely insane. You've not seen anything like that before in the history of credit markets, perhaps. Um, but that has been a, just a ridiculous move there as well. But until high yield credit spreads can narrow, we're not going to call a bottom in this market in, in, in risk. I am quite infused though. If I am trying to pick a silver lining, what's happening in the S&P, the fact that we have managed to defend that December 2018 low so far with some vigour has been quite positive. Obviously, we saw a 31% decline coming through in the S&P, but we've managed to find some sort of bottom in this process. But until high yield credit spreads can come lower, until we actually see um, you know, uh, the volatility index coming lower and incentivise volatility inspired funds uh, to start dipping their toe in, it's very difficult to call a bottom in this market with any conviction, especially as we know there's a lot more economic hard time to come through. The case count continues to move up exponentially in, in most countries, uh, ex-China at the moment. Have a look at what's happening in the currency markets because it's the dollar which I want to focus on. Have a look at the moves we've been seeing here against the US dollar and EM. You know, the Czech uh, Corona down, the Corona down 9.1%. The Hungarian uh, foreign there down 8.8%. You know, you can go across all these currencies and you can see that there's been this big move out of EM. Have a look at this chart here of the Asian dollar index. So as this is going down, it's showing that the dollar is outperforming relative to Asian currencies, these EM currencies. And you can see that's the lowest level since 2000 and really 2000 and what, 2002, 2003. It's broken out. Why bet against this at the moment? In my opinion, that the dollar is on a one-way ticket. Why is the dollar so strong? You know, we have seen um, you know, the government there offering swap lines and the Fed offering swap lines to these various central banks around the world. And that is, is, is reducing um, some pressure on things like euro dollar cross currency basis swaps. 
Um, but you know, you still are seeing very, very high levels of dollar funding, specifically in dollar yen, and also what we're seeing in some of the Asian currencies at the moment. So dollar funding remains an issue. That's working as a kind of a quasi interest rate differential and boosting the US dollar's appeal in that situation. Um, so the, the swap lines still need to come in act. They need to be more aggressive. But at the moment, the EM story is one we're seeing very, very aggressively at the moment. Have a look at what's happening in major currencies as well. Now we talked about what's happening in EM, but look at Noki, down 11.9%, 12%. The Mexican peso, 8.6%. The Australian dollar got just above 55 cents. That was an incredible move. You know, did you see what happened um, when the Reserve Bank came out and talked about quantitative easing, anchoring the three-year government bond to about 225 basis points? You know, the, the, the 10 year Australian government bonds spiked up. Obviously, liquidity has been a major part of that. And why have markets more generally just gone on this, this, this aggressive move? Well, liquidity has been a dominant thematic. There is no liquidity in markets. We've not seen liquidity conditions like this for, for a long time. Whether you're talking bid offer spreads, you're talking the inability for big institutional funds to get out of positions. Obviously, we're going to see New York and London, the big two financial hubs, closing down. People are going to be working from home. That's just created a liquidity vacuum. But liquidity has driven this situation. If you look at that Aussie 10 year spiking up, bang, up it goes and comes back straight down. That's just told you exactly what's been happening there. But Australian dollar down pretty hard. Now this cannot continue going forward. We cannot continue to see the US dollar going in this one way direction, especially in this backdrop where inflation expectations around the world are falling through the floor. Have a look at five year, five year break evens in the US. It potentially could go through 1% next week, despite what we've been seeing that slight pickup in the oil market playing through. Nominal bond yields have been absolutely taken to town. Now we talked about what's happening in the funding markets in the dollar, and that's really important. But I also want to have a look at what's happening in real yield, because if you look at the white line there, you can see that that, that made a bottom um, around March 7th, 8th, and that's pushed up aggressively. Now, we've not seen a move like that in the bond market for, for a long, long time. But if inflation adjusts the 10-year nominal bond yield, and you can see that move up, that's been just absolutely staggering to be now at positive 61 basis points. Yeah, fine, we can look at the, the yield curves, two tens or three month 10 year. Um, but the fact is that real yields have moved up very, very aggressively and the dollar seems to have taken notice as well. So funding plus the move that we've been seeing in the yield curve plus the move that we've been seeing um, in real yields, I think has really boosted that appeal of the dollar. I think the fact that we're seeing real yields moving up so aggressively in this time of higher issuance, in this time of quantitative easing, in this time of de-risking, has also weighed, uh, given a second win to the downside in the S&P, which you can see has really sort of taken taken heart to that, that idea. High of real yields is not good for the S&P in one shape or form. So we are watching that as well. Now, we can't see this issue where the dollar continues to go up on a one-way street forever. It just can't happen. It's not in anyone's interest to see that. The emerging market trade's really breaking down now, and that's the new credit. So we've got credit concerns, we've got funding concerns, and now we've got the EM trade, which is really breaking out. How do we control a situation where the, one, the US dollar is on a one-way tear? We need to see coordinated intervention. Swap lines are just not gonna cut the mustard in this situation. We're staying long US dollars at the moment, but we are concerned um, that that, that it will be a breaking point where the Federal Reserve will need to meet together, maybe some sort of Shanghai Accord, because these, these emerging market countries still have very high debt levels, and that debt is priced in US dollars. Most of it's priced in US dollars, and of course the dollar strengthening is just making those liabilities even more expensive going forward. Now let's have a look at the volatility for, for the next week. I think that's really important. I don't even necessarily want to have a look at the data. I think you know, you've got things like the Bank of England meeting. I think the new thing, situation which we are looking at very closely is what's happening in the weekly jobless claims. If you just saw what happened uh, overnight, that big jump up to 280 odd thousand uh, weekly claims. This is the, the, the probably the, the thing we're looking at very closely as well, as what's happening in manufacturing in, in Europe, but we know that's going to be atrocious. It's For me, it's about labour market readings and probably the forward looking one now. If you look at this chart, is what's happening in the jobless claims. I've taken here, the white line is the four week moving average of the jobless claims. This is one of the most powerful indicators for me that's going to dictate the idea about how big the layoffs are going to be going forward in the US. And we've got this uh, white line and you can really see the, the green line, which is the three year average of the moving, uh, of the, the, the of the jobless claims. Whenever we've really broken through there, you've seen this rate of change accelerate to the top side. So when the white line crosses across the, the, the three year average, you can see this acceleration, this move up where more people are claiming those, uh, those jobless claims. And you can see there that the unemployment rate, the U3 rate really follows suit as that lagging indicator. So we've now seen that breaking through we are going to see a disastrous number next week. There's going to be this massive um, increase in claimants. 
um, and that's really going to push us. So that's something that we are watching very closely. But have a look at the volatility in these markets. Look at have a look at the implied volatility we're seeing there. Um, I don't even. It's not even so much about the average true range that we've been seeing on the left-hand side. Have a look at the one week at the money implied volatility in these markets. Dollar yen, forty-six percent. Now. At one stage this week, we got up to 57%, which is just absolutely crazy. The market's saying, you know, on a, on a, on a year basis, we could see um, the Aussie yen going up or down 57% um, in, in any direction in, in a 12-month period. We're taking that down into a one-week vol, and we're trading at 46%. Now, that says to me that Aussie yen um, could trade with a 68.2% level of confidence in a 344-point move up or down. So that's what trading in a range of 67.03 to 60.0 So nearly a seven, what 700-point range. It's pretty pretty punchy there. Now, can you handle that? If you're not reducing your position size um, in that situation, then then that's very difficult. Now, you know, for someone like myself, who you would usually trade off daily charts. You know, you can't trade with a 344-point stop. Um, you've got to take your time frame right down. These markets can move up or down. You can't be looking to leave positions in the market. These markets can move so, so quickly. Um, Sterling Aussie, 84 percentile. That, in, that implied volatility, 37 percent. You know, the market's betting that you could see that moving up or down 919 points. Can you leave your stop loss 919 points? No. You've got to change the way you trade in this environment. So you are seeing that market predicting that we're likely to trade in a range of one, uh, 209 down to 199. Aussie dollar, of course, we've seen a huge amount of people looking to, to trade into that. There's been so much that's been going on from central banks that have been going forward. Have a look at the acronyms that we've been seeing this week. So in Australia, TFF, you know, term funding facility. In the US, we've seen a, a CPFF, commercial paper fund. Um, MMLF, which is a money market mutual fund to try and offer liquidity into the markets. In the US, PEPP. The bottom line is you've seen this just raft of different liquidity measures from governments and also from central banks trying to get credit out into the system. It's an acronym city going forward. Australia is very much at the heart of that as forward. But we like the QE program. We thought that was fairly powerful, but we just need to know something a bit more quantifiable around that. But the market's expecting 265 points up or down uh, in that market there. And that's trading a range of 59.97 down to 54.67. Can we get down to 57 cent, uh, 50 cents going forward? I'm not so sure at this point in time, uh, but certainly that's what uh, people are looking at at this point in time. Euro dollar, which of course is trending lower at the moment. Euro Swiss also looks like it wants to go lower in this market. You know, you've got that trading uh, 246 points up or down, which is not a million miles away from the five-day average true range of uh, 252 points. The point is with this situation, if you're traditionally trading off daily charts or getting an oversight with weekly charts, maybe even four hours, uh, and you're using this implied volatility to dictate how far you want your stop loss from the market, you know, you can't be, you can't be trading that way at this moment. You can't be having a stop loss 246 points in euro dollar without actually adjusting your position size down to very, very minimal levels there. Have a look at the um, other asset classes there. Of course, the VIX trading, um, you know, 72% at the moment. Uh, until that gets lower, you know, I can't, I can't be calling a bottom in, in risk. Have a look at what's happening in risk reversals as well. The skew of, of call volatility uh, minus that of put volatility for 25 delta one week uh, calls and puts. Aussie dollar obviously springs out there. You've got that 9%. So uh, one week, uh, 25 delta put volatility is trading at a premium of nine vols over, Aussie, uh, over calls. You know, that's zero percentile. It's never been that low, really. Um, gold, gold's an interesting one there. You've got that that trading with um, with with calls now trading uh, at a discount to puts that we haven't seen that for a long time. Um, and so yeah, you can see there that the risk is Aussie dollar. I think that's a really interesting one, and also cable as well. We've got um, calls trading at a discount to puts by three um, three vols there as well, which is a thirty second percentile. So we are seeing a situation where you know continued dollar strength is expected. So we're trying to understand these markets at the moment. It's a liquidity drain. It continues to be a liquidity drain. It's made liquidity measures in the market very, very poor indeed across all asset classes. That makes things very, very difficult. How can we know there's going to be a bottom in the market? Well, that's very, very difficult. We continue to watch fund flow. We continue to watch liquidity measures. We're watching implied volatility. Until that comes back down, you know, it's very difficult to suggest we're out of the woods in any kind of capacity. We expect more of this to come. Central banks, Governments very much are powerless to stop this at the moment. They are helping in terms of the credit situation, but we're watching that data points just to see how bad that gets going forward. But for me, it's about fund flow and people still whether they're going to get into money market funds. So stay safe out there. Obviously, understand your risk as we go into this weekend. Look at your positions as well. It's a wild rest in terms of that market.